Buenas tardes y bienvenidos a Security Research con Open Source Software, Volume Omega. Soy Yesenia. No, this is not going to be in Spanish, so if you just freaked out a little bit, you're welcome. Um, I'm very excited to share information about updates to the Alpha Omega project from OpenSSF. But before that, um, I want to talk to you a little bit about who I am. I'm a first-generation Cuban-American. I'm paving the way to awaken the indominant warrior spirit within all of us, protecting us in both the digital realm and the physical worlds. I'm a proud Latina, standing as a beacon of strength, attacking global security challenges and traveling, while simulationally building communities as a servant leader with a dedication to fostering self-confidence, cultivating partnerships within the tech space, and championing uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Alpha Omega will be at the Grace Hopper Conference next week, um, and we are hosting our OpenSSF uh, Alpha Omega project at the Open Source um, Project Day for Grace Hopper. Um, I have an extensive background spanning over a decade in cybersecurity software development. I hold a bachelor's in computer science, master's in digital forensics. I use none of those. <laughs> and um, I've worked in various areas of cybersecurity, includes security operations, security research and development, supply chain security, and open source software. Beyond my contributions um, to improve protective measures in the cyberspace and our open source ecosystem, I also train Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and I lead our um, women's self defense program called the Lioness Instincts. Uh, throughout my career, I've taken a proactive role in establishing and nurturing various DEI organizations, including co founding the Latinas in Cyber Organization. Um, my advocacy to empower women not only to join but also thrive in the tech industry by being a strong advocate for personal development, self assurance, and acting as a cyber hunter and a big sister. If you're an open SSF day, I spoke a lot. So this morning I woke up and my voice is like, we're not having it today. So it's a little raspy, so bear with me. A uh, little fun agenda for those that don't know about the project. I'm going to dive into the Alpha Omega project, then talk about some of the challenges, give you a little details on the Omega tool chain, talk about our science fiction that we want to make into reality, and how you can contribute if this is an area that interests you. So over to the Alpha Omega side. The Alpha Omega project is the beginning to the end of manual security vulnerability disclosure processes. Both sides has its own unique mission uh, with the alpha side focusing on the now and the omega side focusing on the future. Uh, the alpha side is focusing on working with foundations such as Python, Eclipse, jQuery, and recently announced this week, Rust. Um, in order to improve their security postures through funding and consulting, and then on the mega side, which is where the most of this presentation is going to be about, is the how. How do we bring an end to manual security vulnerability disclosure process and ease the burdens of our open source maintainers uh, so that we can clean up this ecosystem that we're in with little to no headache for our maintainers? So we'll get into that. And here's just a little bit of our how. So as I mentioned, the alpha side is focusing on working with our open source maintainers. But from the Omega side, we're targeting 10,000 critical open source projects. We have a list. Um, we welcome feedback on the list. We've gotten it through multiple uh, sources like Harvard, Consensus, Linux Foundation Research to kind of compile that list. We do, it does need cleanup, um, but any information or guidance you can provide to allow us to target the proper 10,000 or even more um, we just had to throw a number at the wall and go for it. So we said 10,000. And, um, and no, we're not going to shoot for 10,000 at once before anybody is like, are you going to do it? No, I plan on doing a rollout with some pilots. So <laughs> um, a little bit about the team. Our team is less than a year old. Um, I started back in November as a software security engineer. And then ja Jonathan Lightshoe and our mascot, Sassy the Duck. You've probably seen him and the duck 
roaming around the, the halls of this conference. They joined back in January. It's been an interesting ride, as in any open source journey. Uh, with our two extensive backgrounds in security, security vulnerability, we're pioneering this work in hopes to resolve the challenge across the ecosystem. A little update, uh, this summer we had the privilege of hosting our own mentorship. Um, this was run through the Linux Foundation mentorship and we are looking to do it once again next year. We were able to hire four mentees, two were software engineers led by me, and two were security researchers led by Jonathan. Um, it was really great. Starting our journey, it was clear to Jonathan and myself that we needed help. So um, both of us are very passionate about bringing up the next generation of technologists. So we're like, how do we help the next level of technologists as well as move forward towards the mission and objectives of the Alpha Omega project? Um, for more details on what the security researchers did, please reach out to Jonathan. But essentially, they worked on an XSD uh, vulnerability research piece, uh, writing recipes for that, and then um, worked on multi multivariant data flow analysis. And that is the extent of what I can explain on that piece. Um, but as far as the engineering side, we, on the Omega toolchain, I call it three different phases, so to speak, to kind of lessen the complexity of it. We have our identification of our security vulnerabilities. We'll have our triage piece, which is just where I'm compiling all the campaign research, the analysis, the recipe writing, the testing, um, the communications to our open source maintainers, the communication to our source code management systems to make sure we don't DDoS their systems and they're aware of the campaigns we're about to run. And then of course, the security campaign execution. And then part three is the remediation. On this summer mentorship, we focused on the first piece, which is the identification. So we have a tool called the Omega Analyzer, uh, which scans, which is a Docker container that contains about 20 plus open source um, scanners, including some proprietary licensing tools. Um, we have that piece, it runs, it scans an open source project that's pulled down from either um, GitHub or it's ran on your local. From that, it produces a single serif file, and from that, we uploaded it to our central hub, which is called our triage portal. Um, so the mentees essentially developed the whole full flow from our analyzer into the triage portal, developing a GraphQL uh, graphing API, um, implementing um, authentication hardening, so JWT token to make sure that we have an authorized user submitting our uh, serif file, validation that it is a serif file, and then check some to make sure that from our analyzer to our triage portal, these results haven't been compromised. A few other updates. Uh, we do have a university program that will be on hold for right now. During the summer, we had uh, Purdue University working with us, leveraging the Omega analyzer for their research. Um, more will come out on that soon. Uh, we've also had the creation of the Vulnerability Disclosure Auto Fix SIG. Uh, I see some participants here that are um, part of it. And from the SIG, um, I'll go into more details on the documentation further. We've created the specifications, uh, drafted out document for the specific specifications on how to run an auto fix campaign creation. So taking the open source maintainer in consideration uh, taking our source code management system in consideration, how would one actually run this on their own, and then kind of guidelines for how the Alpha Omega team is going to run it. Uh, most of the conversation for the Omega automation is driven through this uh, working stick through the OpenSSF. Um, we also have Alpha grants that have been um, sent out, and there's uh, been big mention within OpenSSF day on Alpha Omega. Uh, mostly working with open source foundations, but you can check the open SSF blog for public release or any information on that Because I'm not too sure which ones I should mention which ones I shouldn't so I'll just leave it up to the blog So some of the challenges So this one's interesting. I was I was having a conversation with somebody earlier this week about this problem and they presented the idea of a doctor and a prescription and I'm still structuring this in mind so the challenges may be similar in some nature, um, and grants in medicine and security vulnerabilities are two big different complex issues, but a security vulnerability in open source is like an infection, it essentially is a sickness. 
At times we walk around and we're not aware that we have an illness. And it's not until we see a doctor or run a security scanner that we become aware of this sickness. If we choose to see a doctor, some of us may be stubborn and not seek this medical uh, professional, while others may just not have a means to seek these medical professionals. A doctor can prescribe a remediation, so similar to chatting to a security, uh, security expert about the vulnerability you found. Now, as I said, I could be stubborn with prescribed remediations from a medical professional. Sometimes I just ignore it. Um, and just allow my body to naturally heal. However, software hasn't had this magical property that we humans have to get rid of sicknesses. So not yet at least. So we can just ignore it or we can do something about it. If we work with the doctor and follow their, their guidance for remediation, it will heal the infection that was discovered. So once again, both medical and security vulnerabilities are just much more complicated than this. There's the human aspect as well to security vulnerabilities disclosures, such as an open source maintainer has a life. We all know that we have lives. A lot of these projects are side projects or we're just running um, multiple things at once that it's really hard to stop and sit back and do the research necessary to understand how to remediate this vulnerability that we've discovered. Um, on top of that, these are stats that Jonathan has published, so there's no uh, research on it that I can point to. However, a single vulnerability has taken him from three to eight plus months to, full, to flow through a full vulnerability disclosure process with a singer, single maintainer. So we have a long lifespan from identification to full remediation, even when providing a patch. So let's move over to the tool chain. Our mission is to build tools and processes for conducting automated campaigns that discover, triage, and remediate security findings to significantly reduce the presence of security vulnerabilities at scale, that's the important piece and the more complicated piece, from our open source software ecosystem. Just a little highlight of some of the multiple tools that we are building. All of them are in PLC, very much development, and we do need assistance and contribution and putting these pieces together uh, to make them all work and communicate and all the wonderful things that come with software development like testing, operations, uh, CI, CD pipelines, deployment. I can just go on with that list. Uh, so essentially, I have a pointer. I remember I have a pointer. Our analyzer, uh, this is the one I mentioned earlier, it's a Docker container with 20 plus security scanners. This is what we'll be doing the analysis. That analysis is sent over to our triage portal. And our triage portal is kind of like a centralized hub where we'll be doing a lot of the orchestrations of our automation. Uh, we also have our assertion assurance assertion framework. Um, and this is our policy driven bar, which is an additional bonus to what we're trying to build. And this is essentially as an open source, um, let's say um, you get a lot of SQL injections. However, your database you know, you've looked at it, you've, un you've analyzed it, and you're like, this is more of a false positive. It's not really affecting us. It might be a, a database used for cache or testing, or it's not used in any functional way that the impact of the vulnerability is going to um, have a likelihood of bringing you down. So you can write a policy to just say, if you continue seeing this, just ignore it. Um, we have our disclosure check, which we're trying to move over to, we're trying to, or we did move it to the vulnerability disclosure working group. And this is essentially uh, what scans on open source projects and collects a lot of the disclosure contact information. So is there a security.md file? Who do we contact? Is there an email associated? Kind of getting those communication first pieces of how and who do we communicate if we do identify a security vulnerability. Um, and then moving more into the, the nitty gritty of the security pieces, we have our open auto vulnerability disclosure, which is a state flow machine to orchestrate the vulnerability at scale. Right now that piece is um, most of the tests have been written and then the functionality to flow through the different states is the next steps. But this is kind of what will be flowing through um, the steps for our vulnerability disclosures. And then we work with uh, Modern so Jonathan has written a wrapper around the Modern uh, SaaS client, 
which will go ahead and automate a lot of our security vulnerability uh, uh, reporting into GitHub. One of the concerns and issues with it is that currently pushes for public issues. One of our goals is to make it where it pushes into private issues, which is a capability we're still scratching our heads on how do we implement this and uh, get this done. We're working with uh, GitHub and Modern to kind of figure out these functionalities and features so that we could automate into a private vulnerability. Uh, so just a little deep dive into the analyzer. As I mentioned multiple times, it's a 20, it's a Docker container with 20 plus security tools. Most of them are open source. And then we do have some license, like a sneak, sneak. I always say that one wrong, but it is what it is. Uh, it connects to our assertion framework for the policy-based data, if you wish. Um, we've also implemented over the summer a flag that you can push it to a production or a local instance of a triage portal. It produces a single Sero file with all the results. So it'll scan with all 20 or whatever set of scanners you set it to, and you'll receive one file with all the results. You will, you will receive multiple files per results, but we did compilate and compile all the results into one. So it makes it easier <coughs> instead of looking at 20 different pages with or 20 different documents with 80 different pages. Now you get one document with a good set amount <laughs> and you can actually structure it. So you can only get the criticals and the highs um, and produce the results you actually want to see. Um, that's our link to our GitHub. Next is our triage portal. I'm not going to play the demo that's just there for content. And if you wish to uh, look at it, that was a demo from our mentorship and some of the changes that we did to the triage portal to produce uh, these results. Uh, our main goals is to add automation. As I mentioned, this is going to be our centralized system. This is going to be the system that's going to be orchestrating our automation of pulling the contact information from our open source maintainers repos. Uh, documenting how to contact if they prefer an email if they prefer jira if they just want us to you know create a public if they want us to do a private whatever method it is we'll be collecting that with a disclosure check and updating that on the portal uh, it will be helping us track vulnerability disclosure i don't know how many people here have done security vulnerability oh, raise of hands how easy is it to keep track of all of it I see some smiles, doesn't seem easy, right? Let's say you pull about 10,000 <laughs> pull requests. How do you keep track of that? So that's a common issue right now is keeping track of where we're at with those communications and um, really understanding like I have a large scale of pull requests, um, each of them at a different state, each of them at a different level of conversation, each of them with a different problem. Um, so being able to provide a central system for our security uh, security researchers to be able to keep track of the work that they're doing. Um, creation of private vulnerability disclosures as well in GitHub. So having that automation system tool to be able to actually automate your creation of your um, PVR, your private vulnerability report in GitHub. And then being able to publish any reports or any fixes that you have with it and performing some actions in GitHub. Like, let's say I need to add a comment or uh, an, a comment was added. I need an update to know that I need to reach out to that individual maintainer. Uh, it is built on Python Django framework. There's both a UI and an administrator background, backend uh, with Redis and Postgres and then some lovely Easter egg uh, QR codes and some links. Oh, no, we are not watching the video. All right, cool. This one we will watch. Um, we This is the Omega Modern Client, and this is the piece of the automation that kind of keeps track of public vulnerability reports from when uh, campaigns are ran, just so you can get um, a view of what happens. It's a very short one minute video that would probably end. But as you can see, an, uh, a campaign has been executed. Um, we have the status of where that campaign has been ran. And this isn't the status of remediation or anything. This is just the status of a campaign running. Um, you can see the associated organization, the associated repo, 
which branch it's targeting, which modes are master or main, whichever the default branch has been set for that organization. Um, the number of results that it returns. So this is the number of lines or uh, areas that we've identified the specific vulnerability that we're executing on, um, file searched, and then time ran. And I, I think it's finished or the video's over. But we'll move on anyway. So some science fiction to reality, because I mean, I'm a nerd. I love Star Wars, Legos, Super Mario, anything that's not real, it's just, it's great. So when I came out to this project, it just seemed like a science fiction idea. It was like, how do we scale all this? How do we just identify all the vulnerabilities out there, create a fix, send it out, patch it, and move on with our life, doing 10,000 millions at a time really cleaning up the ecosystem. If we've, you've worked in development for a while, you know there's a large tech debt of both documentation. That's another, that's another one where we're not gonna get into this talk. Documentation, security, testing, operation, those pieces. So uh, the vision for this is essentially being able to automate the creation of private vulnerability reports. Currently with GitHub, we will expand by focusing right now with GitHub because baby steps. Um, with a fix at scale. We're looking to do over thousands of pull requests, tracking and monitoring of the executed, executed security campaign fix, uh, properly managing the communication. So having a central system that helps let us know like, hey, this one wants an email, this one wants, uh, this one does not have private enabled. So let's create a, an issue, a public issue requesting that they enable private. Um, auditing and metrics, because we all know stakeholders like that. None of us. I don't know anybody here. Anybody here likes audits and metrics? That's what I thought. Oh, one person. There you go. <laughs> Data science background? No. I, I, no. No. The no. answer is no. Short answer is no. <laughs> and then, of course, retrospective feedback from our maintainers. We're, we're pushing these processes out. We're affecting their workflow. We're reflecting their lives, essentially. So we want to make sure that what we're doing is not butting heads with them, is not getting them upset, is not getting them on X, Twitter, Metrodome, and yelling at us. Um, it's essentially, I would like for this to happen. And someone was like, you just made my life easier. That's my goal. Um, so really getting that feedback and that iterative process communication with our maintainers to make sure that we're doing this well, which is where a lot of the folks in this room come in, um, is to make sure that we're not going to butt heads and we're not going to have to, you know, rumble. And then, of course, as I mentioned, incremented rollouts. So starting with probably a pilot of 10 or working with a foundation to just target them um, to make sure that once we do go at scale, we're not burning bridges or the world, you know, it's like that dog meme, even though I love chaos. Where's Ryan? Ryan's not here. Chaos. Okay. <laughs> uh, through the uh, vulnerability autofix SIG, uh, we've worked through several different types of documentation. As I mentioned earlier, we have our specification document, a little top one right there. It's a long document. It's a long read. It's a good night's sleep read but um, it's kind of how we're trying to drive our vulnerability automation. So if you need a good read, if you got a long plane flight and you want to provide feedback on how to make this process better, that would be one of them that I start with. Um, that's more of the nitty gritty of technical how and some guidance that we're also sharing for our community. Uh, for OpenSSF and for Alpha Omega, we've also worked with creating proposals and documentation on Outgoing vulnerabilities, so somebody in OpenSSF or Alpha Omega has identified a vulnerability, what's our process going to look like, and then vice versa. You have uh, somebody out in the ecosystem has found a vulnerability within Alpha Omega. We're vulnerable, yes, we are all vulnerable. Or OpenSSF, how do they come in and uh, do the same thing and provide us feedback on letting us know, like, hey, we have, we've identified this and found this. Uh, go ahead and check the documents itself for its status. They all three been at different stages, so um, opening the document itself will allow you to see. 
And where, we're, where I'm really requesting some feedback is in the design. If you like architecting, if you like security, if you like vulnerabilities, if this interests you, we are working on designing our user stories and our next steps to kind of roadmap what the Alpha Omega Omega pieces are looking like. We've identified eight, if I can count this morning, <laughs> eight different personas that will be interacting with our systems or ourselves at some point or time. Um, this is a security fix engineer. This person's primary focus is creating a recipe. So they're the ones that are going to be looking at a vulnerability, doing the analysis, working with um, our different clients like the Modern client to create a recipe that will go ahead and fix it. Modern is limited to only Java at this moment that we know of. So also looking at other systems to be able to uh, support other languages. Our security researcher would be the one that will drop in and do some of the um, analysis as well and working with the open source container. Um, as far as the technical nitty gritty, we have our non-alpha omega organization. So these could be some of the foundations. Um, anybody that's not an alpha omega, anyone that's an organization that's not alpha omega essentially um, that will be interacting with us. Uh, we do have some stakeholders and some folks that are uh, working in collaboration open source containers like yourselves um, are probably the biggest persona on this. Our developer advocates, it's very important to continue having a proper communication with our open source containers. So being able to have that relationship building with them and keeping sure that if we do submit 10,000, we're not going to be spending the time of a security researcher to go through each and every GitHub issue or pull request, but we can spend a developer advocate to look it over, kind of be our t um, tier one customer support and escalate any issues to the appropriate member internally um, so that we can alleviate. Granted, this is all big dreams. It's only me and Jonathan. So we are both wearing multiple of these hats. Um, software security engineer, we need the folks that are gonna be building, operating, maintaining, and troubleshooting the system. And then our Alpha Omega stakeholders, that's where the metrics come in. And then uh, we're looking to leverage uh, LFIT for some of the cloud operations. So these are the different types of personas that we were seeing to interact with our system. If um, you want more details on and just de uh, definition on what they are, uh, this document, this document up here, the user stories, is kind of where we define some of those concepts. We define some of the concepts for our internal vulnerability um, fix campaigning our requirements, our requirements per persona, and then some of the GitHub features that we're looking to chat with them to roadmap into their product. And then if you're more of a planner and wanna go into the nitty gritty details of those individual user stories, we do have a spreadsheet that we're working on our planning, our prioritization, our dependencies, and all the fun documentations that all of us engineers love doing, right? More of a, let's just get this going. Yay, there you go, yay. Um, so we are in the mix of working on that. So we would appreciate any feedback to kind of um, help drive this and make sure that we're prioritizing properly to get um, what you need. And then how to contribute. This I think is the most important section. Um, OpenSSF, um, if you're not a member, the slide is just to show you the different ways that you can work with us, uh, YouTube, Slack channel, mailing list, uh, public meetings. We do have for the Alpha Omega project, a monthly meeting. Um, and then we do work with several of the working groups. I saw some folks taking pictures, okay. Um, to work with us specifically, we have our repositories. Um, I might be missing one. So the analyzer, the analyzer and the assertion framework fall under the first one. Oh, I'm missing the disclosure check. The disclosure check is not out there. And then um, on the OpenSSF Slack, these are the channels that we work off of. Uh, we are heavy participants in the vulnerability disclosures. We run the vulnerability disclosure auto fix group. And then I work heavily within the security education and DEI, and that's where a lot of the university and the mentorship came out of. We have a public meeting. Uh, vulnerability disclosure meets every week on Wednesdays. We have multiple. We have um, the vulnerability disclosure, we have the auto fix, and then we have the, the APAC call. I'm not sure. I think it's the vulnerability disclosure APAC call. 
And then if you want to get into the nitty gritty, get your hands into the wheels and grind out some of our issues, uh, we have technical uh, issues. You can look for first, first good issues or help wanted. You might see help wanted on a lot of them. Um, you can check that out or reach out to myself and see where you can get started. Um, and then of course, non-technical uh, issues are always welcomed uh, for those that are either new and trying to understand the product or the space. You can go ahead and start with that and then we can gradually move you into more technical if that's where your career path and goals are. And with that, I like to keep my things, my presentation short, short and sweet. So thank you for your time today and listening to me. I know we're right before lunch, so I see the lunch faces. So I don't want to keep you from that before the lines get long, but thank you so much for attending the um, presentation today. And if we have any questions. Um, thank you. I, I was um, I was curious if uh, to what extent um, upgrading dependencies within a project is in the scope for for Alpha Omega, or if you're looking for, or if you're only looking to fix vulnerabilities that exist within the project itself and not its dependencies. So not so not taking a project and drilling down into the dependencies, but the dependency may be in our list. Sure. And, and I suppose what I'm asking is like, would you ever help, help a project upgrade from one outdated dependency to the, to the new supported dependency that doesn't have a vulnerability, but maybe the project can't, can't do that upgrade because of like API incompatibility or something like that, but they can't easily do it. So if it is a, version difference that could be part of our remediation guidance um, but as far as targeting that and putting that in scope it is not in our scope but if we do see one and we're like hey i'm not going to send you a fix or maybe our fix is just going to your requirements file and updating upgrading to the next um that is something we can do but it, it's looking more into um i like to use a sql injection because that one's a little bit less complicated um, but if we have identified a SQL injection in your code, we've identified it 10 times throughout, is we'll submit one pull request, one pull request, fixing each lines of those code at, uh, where SQL injection was identified. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Where's the hard questions? Come on. Yeah, something a bit related to that. Um, as you, as I, as far as I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, you try to like get this uh, all the vulnerabilities and make a single point of uh, communication for for that. And with that, it would be really interesting. And I, I haven't seen this on your um, users um, and user stories slide, but uh, wouldn't it be interesting to um, to include like package maintainers for distributions or something like these roles that can be um, can benefit from your work as um, as not the primary target but as a secondary target or stakeholder so working with the package managers like in the communication process yes. if i'm understanding it correctly yeah. because they have to update the the open source project they are maintaining as in not maintainer of a project, but maintainer as a package maintainer. And that's a valid point. That one's come up a couple of times in our discussion, but from the way we're perceiving it, and granted, you know, we can always have a discussion about this, is that's where the CVEs come in. So once you do the fix and you push out the CVEs, it should be the package maintainer's responsibility to communicate to who's using it and saying, hey, we just fixed this. Um, I think coming in from us might provide overhead and maybe miscommunications between multiple parties. Um, but it is something that we've been kind of trying to figure out like, yeah, we're going to do a fix, but we also don't want to scare the co consumer before it's actually fixed. Um, and there is a process afterwards that once it's fixed, that the maintainer should be communicating properly to it. 
um, we are targeting and um, one of our objectives is for a CVE to come out of this at the end, which requires that communication downstream. Good questions. We got one in the back. All right, let's, let's, uh, there we go. So um, I work in JavaScript mostly, uh, so you know dependencies are much deeper there. Mm -hmm. um, what you're describing with the Omega stuff and the this like automated patching sounds like another way to add like a second Dependabot basically, which you know I talk to GitHub and give them feedback about Dependabot. Um, are, what are you doing to like uh, you know when patches are going out in PRs? Um, what are you doing to like try to help like with balancing maintainer burnout and like uh, reducing the burden on maintainers in addition to that? Or is that like a consideration at all? Yes. So a few things. One, you can opt out. So if you don't want no, no more quote unquote bots, you're welcome to opt, opt out. But that does stop us from sending you any communications. We will fork your project and provide a fix for it as a secondary repository saying, um, so and so, you know, this project has opt out, but we're creating a fix for this specific vulnerability so that it's available for the public. Um, we're also making sure that we're communicating with, so we're not just gonna ad hoc just send out millions of pull requests. And we've been working closely with uh, some of maintainers that are like, I want one pull request for that one vulnerability, please let me know ahead of time in case I'm on vacation. And because once we send that out, there's a clock ticking, um, but I'm really pushing for communication. So, hey, we're about to, you know, hey, maintainer X, we're about to go ahead and just send this out. We've identified it to you. You're gonna get this. It starts the clock. Please work with us to make sure that it eases your burden because it could be a lot. <laughs> but uh, this could be automated as well. I mean, this could be something that the maintainer can like put out there how they want to be contacted. Yes. Yeah. Usually in the security.md file or even in there, they mention which method they want. They may not want private vulnerability report. Um, a common way is like email and JIRA. Um, we're not going to support JIRA. That's, I, there's, JIRA just traumatizing me. It's just, I hear it and I'm traumatized. I wrote an API around JIRA to do security events and that's, that's the end of that. Um, but we need to work with them in some form or fashion. So it's going to be email, private, private issue saying we've identified something, please enable, uh, public issue, please enable private uh, point of failure reporting. In that issue, the maintainer can comment, be like, oh, send me an email, send me a JIRA, and we'll just start that communication to make sure that we're notifying them that what it is and trying to send the information as secure as possible. And then I saw a question in the back. Uh, so two questions. Um, one, have you run into instances where people have wanted to opt out of the process? Yes. Uh, and how do you handle it? So this is mostly the work of Jonathan um, for the vulnerability, more on the engineer. He essentially uh, has done a robot.txt file that just, he adds like them no, to it. No trace, basically. Kind of. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, all right, you opt out, but I'm just going to create a fork of your project provide the fix and that way at least if somebody finds it they get a clean version um uh second question um how are you uh so i see a lot of cool tools there that have potentially like overlap with other open ssf projects how are you collaborating with the maintainers there across the working groups to make sure that there's not duplicative effort trying to there's so many meetings and only two of us so I'm hoping during these conversations, folks can uh, reach out to me and be like, hey, we already did this. And I'll be like, sweet, I don't have to do it. <laughs> Definitely, I'll find you after. <laughs> yeah, we, we need to move away from meetings as a default communication mechanism. Um, I'm curious.
curious if you could speak to um, targeting Java first and um, what are the ecosystems you're looking at next? Like, is that a representative of the 10,000, the list of 10,000 projects that you uh, are working towards? Or is that kind of opportunistic because, hey, there's open rewrite and that's kind of solving a lot of problems? Yeah, so right now, good question. Uh, which languages are we retargeting? Um, Open Rewrite, which is the Mandarin client, is primarily focused on Java. I know they're putting support for other languages. I'm not sure what the languages are. The Analyzer supports Python, Go, and NPM. Um, I would like to go for Python next. Uh, I feel like, uh, I'm not gonna say it. it, might cause controversy. Go, go might be a little okay, but, um, <laughs> uh, you know, but looking, I know from the list, Python and NPM have a larger span across uh, the ecosystem. So it's, it would be identifying the list, talking to them and seeing who wants to work with us. So could I interpret that, that um, you might have targeted something else first if there wasn't already nice tooling for Java and that helped you kind of prove some of the ideas Yes. Yeah. So definitely um, working mostly with Java because it, it already has a system in place for us to do our POC. We've been able to, well, Jonathan's been able to support and showcase the automated scaling. Um, I don't know the number. I'm going to throw it a random number out there that I think it is. I'm just randomly generating 35,000 pull requests. I think he did. If you saw his talk yesterday, he went into the number. Um, but using that as the proof of concept for this research, um, and yes, we do have the restrictions on open rewrite with just Java. Um, it's something that we're looking to overcome in the next couple of months to figure out how do we get Python, how we get Go, and how do we get NPM, because that's where our identification system can work on. Thank you. You're welcome. I got a question, what's for lunch? Where's our good food here? I need paella, I haven't found good paella. The question on uh, false positives, so for example, uh, Dependapod likes to open these pull requests to update the dependencies for generating checker pages, but most of those aren't really security vulnerabilities due to how the package is used. So the package may have a security vulnerability, but the context in which it is used uh, doesn't have a security vulnerability. So how do you handle false positives in, uh, in these cases? So that would be a communication with us. Um, this is where I would hope the developer advocate would come in and um, either the maintainer reaches out to us directly, reaches out to through the comments saying, hey, I don't think this is right. We value your opinion and you know your system way better than we do. Um, so being able to say, this isn't a, a security vulnerability for us. We'll have that conversation. We'll make sure that we're both in line, that it's not. Um, we close it if it's not and then with the assertion framework, you could add a policy to make sure that, hey, you can avoid this. And if you've noted to us, we do need um, kind of like an opt-out vulnerability piece to it, um, just from conversations that I've had this week, it's something else that we've talked about uh, for this situation and case as well, is to make sure it's like, but we don't want to exclude it completely because it could appear later on in the future, right? Could be a there could be multiple languages in that project and it's just maybe the documentation that you want to exclude, not the yeah. entire project. Yeah, good point. The other one is that we've also found them in test. So we are excluding test um, unless it's a dire situation, but very valid. Any other questions? Going once, going twice. I released you for lunch. <laughs>